Okay. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome, welcome to the second Cortex Logic uh, workshop. Um, yesterday was actually very interesting. It was was it three, four, uh, three hours? Yeah, it was, it, it, was uh, it was a really great session. You're going to do more or less the same. So I'm really looking forward to that. Yeah. So uh, just very quickly to introduce uh, Yandre, uh, the little story that I normally do. Um, well, I did, did that I did yesterday. So Yandre specifically, he's going to focus on. He's going to run this workshop. I'm just going to do a, a quick introduction to Cortex Logic and some of the use cases, and it's almost like that little flash talk uh, that I did yesterday as well, just talking about what we're about, just to do, to, to so you can get an idea of what we're doing. Um, but the main focus of this workshop will be to actually go through very specific vision applications using deep learning. And he's actually going to take you from scratch through it. And we're looking at things like uh, there's going to be binary classification, there's going to be object detection. Um, he's going to look at specifically at traffic, uh, which is going to be interesting. What's a truck, what's a vehicle, and those type of things. So we've got access to live stream data. Um, so that, that's going to be cool. And then segmentation as well. When you look at a human figure, to segment that out uh, as well. So it's going to be practical. Are you going to cover all of that today as well? I'll, I'll, I'll show examples of that, but I, the, the use case we're going we're gonna to cover today is, is a multi-class classification problem. And awesome. So that we're going to do in detail, and then I'll show you, because the other, the other tasks are very similar, has a very similar workflow, and I'll just, I, I train a few models, and I'll show you how it runs on the, on the web, using the webcam. Awesome. So it's going to be a nice and practical. Now a little story here. So. There, there's a deep learning in Dalva going on in Stellenbosch. Who knows about deep learning in Dalva? Okay, why are you not there? <laughs> no, um, I, I was there. We actually launched it. No, this is great. This is going to be. I'm glad you're here. You're going to learn a lot. You're going to get something similar, even better, <laughs> right here, because it's going to be uh, very specific, and uh, we're going to unpack some specific use cases. But anyway, just a quick story. So. Last year we had a deep learning in Daba at Wits University. There were over 300 deep learning practitioners or people that just participated in the conference. I think this year it's 500 plus at Stellenbosch University. But anyway, right, and, and, and I was there and we had a bunch of people there and Yandra was also there. And, and then right after that we had a hackathon, uh, a vision hackathon, uh, hackathon focusing on potholes. You know, potholes the big problem here in South Africa. <laughs> We didn't uh, know each other. What's that? We didn't know each other. Yeah, we, we didn't know. We, we didn't know each other at all. So he was, uh, anyway, so, but anyway, so, what we, but he obviously applied, and there was a bunch of other teams. There were some big teams, there were some companies, uh, Authenticate, for instance, they just specialize in this as well. And they had their laptops and their teams there, and, and everybody was organizing teams. If you go to the Machine Intelligence Africa at Orc, who, who knows about MIA? Machine Intelligence Chief of Africa, okay, a few. I would recommend that you all just, uh, it's, it's a non-profit organization, it's an AI community for Africa, it's looking at, so I can show a bit more details about that as well, it's, we, we're hosting a bunch of events, There's, we have that one hackathon that I will talk a little bit more about now, and we also, um, we're also looking at projects and all sorts of different things. It's a non-profit organization really building it's, it's, it's machine intelligence and data science research and applications. And the focus is really to transform Africa using smart technology. So it's, so it's worthwhile going there. Anyway, if you go there, you will see there's a bunch of resources listed there. Courses, training, tools, all sorts of things. And also our events as, is listed there. And, and on the events section, you also see the hackathon. Uh, with the details, the problem. I think we've got links to the the winning Python notebooks, the solutions, the data, and everything. It's it's actually there, so it's worthwhile um, uh, looking at that. But anyway, you'll see the photos and everything there, so you get a sense of, of that event. But it was an awesome event, a full day event, um, and and the bottom line is, um, he was the winner. He won the competition. So uh, as a, as a one single guy working that. <laughs> Uh, that is worthwhile looking at the presentation and sharing that. But anyway, so obviously we've appointed him in Cortex Logic. So we're looking at top talent and stuff, so there we go. Anyway, so just
just a little story there, um, and, 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 and it's also relevant in terms of what Fortix is doing. So we, we're just focusing on the vision applications. There's a bunch of stuff in terms of that. You think about unstructured data, video, audio, text, and so forth. Um, you see uh, vision is a very important thing. Another area of, of expertise, uh, or important area for us is natural language understanding. And we're building customer service chatbots, and we've got Talcom represented here as well, so, uh, so that really that's, that's, that's awesome. Um, but it's important for us in terms of robot advisors, in terms of in healthcare industry, if you think about companion or chatbots that actually help you with treatment plans, we're build, busy building those type of solutions. It's a very exciting space. Um, and it's also, if you think about phones with intelligent capability, it actually provides you with the opportunity to get more information about the user. So it's like a sensor on you. And that information is important to actually feedback so you can have more context about a user. Anyway, so what I'm going to do very quickly, a brief introduction, then I'm going to give it all over to Yandre. Um, and I just want to say thank you to Peter Wilson as well. So he's been helping us big time on all sorts of levels. So, but there will be some exciting stuff that, we, that he will present as well. He's a GIS data science expert, so <laughs> we'll talk more about that. Anyway, so Cortex Logic, so what, what, are we, what do we do? So we're an AI engine for business, uh, for platform businesses and corporates. Now we live in the smart technology era, so you see all these disruptors. You see um, Airbnb, Uber, you see well, Google, Facebook, all these companies um, are making incredible impact on, on all the biggest companies in the world. Um, and it's, it's all platform businesses, data-driven, AI-driven platform businesses. If you look at Amazon recently got to a trillion dollars, um, and Apple is also a trillion dollar company. Now, what we are doing is we recognize a, a lot of opportunities in niche areas, in certain domains, in certain industries where there's platform or there's businesses that needs to be data-driven, AI-driven, and we can, what we do is we operationalize AI. So we provide end-to-end -end AI solutions. We're also helping corporates. They need to thrive in this new smart technology era. So that's, so, so that's something else that we do. So that's kind of a summary. So if you think about any solution, uh, because it's so data driven, if you think about the AI machine learning toolboxes being enriched by the deep learning stacks and all of that, the ability to work with unstructured data as well, not only structured data, um, it's very important to enable smart data uh, as well. So, so we are, that is an important foundation. And then effectively what you want to do is you want to automate your AI effectively. And you can't automate if you don't have rapid access to all available data. So this is all part of that end-to-end -end pipeline. And then the, what you also want to do, so what do you do this for? You want to integrate it, this into the business, into the workflows, into the intelligent virtual assistants, into the omni-channel uh, as well. So, so those type of things is very important. You want to help with decision making. Um, so, so that's all critical uh, pieces. Anyway, so, so you can see end-to-end -end solutions uh, captured there. And you can also look at solutions from this perspective where you classify helping to drive, optimize the business. For all customer-facing businesses, it's you want to actually have a growing, satisfied customer base. So that is critical. And then you've got employees, which is very important. There's a saying that technology makes it possible, that people make it happen. And, and uh, so productive employees is absolutely critical. And then smart systems, cybersecurity, fraud, all sorts of things, uh, which is important. And really, why don't we do the AI? It's, it's nice and cool to work with AI and build these applications, but it needs to serve a purpose. It needs to solve a problem. And if you look at business, it's really all about the value drivers um, of the business. And you can, and I've just categorized it here, you can look at increasing operational efficiency and effectiveness and revenue. So you want to up the productivity, increasing automation, improving processes, but also if you increase the revenue, even things like well, cross-selling, upselling, recommendation engine, as you know, is very important. But I think also critical, if you think about the mining industry, minerals, metals, manufacturing industry, 1% improvement in throughput, yield, quality, implies millions of dollars. Um, um, so, so there's a lot of value in that. And then also for those type of companies, reducing the risk is also important. So predictive maintenance. If you think about a jet engine, you've got say two, th 3,000 sensors around that. With that information, you can in real time build a predictive model around the state of that jet engine. That information is valuable for predictive maintenance purposes. So you get companies like General Electric that's actually selling not only the jet engine, but also the SLAs that goes with this. So this is very important for those type of companies. And in healthcare, if you look at MRI scanners, and it's all, all about availability and making sure that this thing is actually in production, can work. 
Um, and there's many, many other use cases. And obviously, we know that you can create strategic value with, with AI. Um, so data's in your oil. If you've got access to, to data, you can create more revenue streams. So, so that's very important. And I think for customer-facing businesses, that's the third category there, it's, it's really, I think we've got now a, a wonderful opportunity to create truly enhanced customer experiences um, and, and have more targeted sales and marketing. Now, and, and, and this is all what we want. If you look at your cell phone, I think we started getting used to real-time, on-demand, digital, personalized services. And if other businesses are not providing that type of service, you feel it's below par. What's going on here? Well, we, we expect more. Um, so, so that is driving a lot of businesses to actually embrace this. Now, if you think about AI, I think there is obviously applications in data science in actually, I, I talk about deep 360 degree insights about the customer, unlocking the value there. We've got a rich toolbox there. But on the human computer interface, the technology is becoming mature enough to actually help with natural language understanding and all of those type of things so you can actually have better human computer interface uh, communications and stuff. So that's a different application area uh, of, of AI. Anyway, so that, that in a nutshell, I'm, just, I'm going to skip a few things here. You can go to the website to get more information. This is just showing more the bigger story in terms of data lakes and data warehouses and how do you actually enable that. So I'll, I'll skip that for now. And maybe this, and then I'll show you one quick example, and then, um, then we can start straight away with, with this. It's already a bit longer than 15 minutes. So if you look at your analytics spectrum, you get different types of analytics, and we can apply different types of um, AI. So there's descriptive analytics, what happened, diagnostic, why did it happen, discoveries, what's hidden in the data, as you use unsupervised techniques to look at the natural clusters in the data as well. Um, predictive, where you, there's a lot more value now because you can actually now predict and forecast going forward. You can predict current values, but you can also predict into the future. And to predict into the future is, is, is just a data preparation exercise. Because you basically still create input-output mapping. If you look at the neural network, it's input-output mapping. But if you shift things in time, you say, I'm not just learning current state to current output, or current input to current output. I'm actually uh, having current, uh, looking at my current inputs, maybe, and also past inputs. And I'm mapping that to a uh, future, maybe a day ahead, a week ahead. Then you learn that input-output mapping. Um, as well. So there's so many things that you can do in arranging your problem and, and constructing that. So predictive is very important, but I think what's absolutely critical is the prescriptive side. So what do you do with this information? Can, I, can you actually give people advice? Can you help decision making? Can you give a prescribed action? And this is where things are going as well. And you will see also AI, also auto, you, you will also see decision making being automated. So if I've got another slide that talks about assisted intelligence, augmented intelligence, and then autonomous intelligence. So you see this in investing as well, where this decision automatically being made. Um, and obviously one needs to be super careful with that. But if you think about even things like advanced process control, when you actually close the loop in a, in a planned setup, you can actually <coughs> clearly see um, where, where, where you're actually giving very specific actions to the operator, maybe this is what you need to do to tune the process, or you actually close the loop and you just update the process accordingly. It's a non uh, it's a non-linear dynamical system, and you just update that. So, so those are all examples of prescriptive. And then finally, cognitive is is where it's really more natural communications, where the enhanced computer interface comes into play. But it's also about explainability. If you so make predictions, you make prescriptions, you would like the, the AI to to actually provide you with information around uh, the, the very specific um, actions that have been taken. Why has it been taken? Um, so, so that is that is that is pretty important. So you want to reason with purpose. You want to learn at scale. We're also talking about real-time learning. Okay, so we're gonna. So maybe the one simple example I just want to quickly show you because it's kind of kind of topical. And I shared this, this yesterday. So this is an example um, that's generic across multiple customer-facing businesses. Sure. People are really worried they lose their keep their customer base. And so I just want to quickly share this very quickly. So. Um, so this is an example where we're looking at funeral policy insurance data sets. So this was main members and dependents and these payment transactions. And in this particular instance, we built predictive models that's, that's, that's pretty accurate, 94% accurate on test data. So that's critical as well. You don't want to have accurate models that's just on the training data. You want to make sure that it can generalize well. So it's very important that it's not memorizing. It's, you test it on unseen data that's not been through the training. 
And this is an example of that. We, we've built models here not only for lapsed propensity, but also for non-active members as well. And this is the kind of analysis that you typically do before you actually build the models. You can look at the factors. You can look at the, the gender distribution. You look at the plan region distribution. You maybe want to remove outliers to help your, your, your models. You're looking at the member age. You can see it ranges over the whole spectrum there, um, all the way from, say, 20 to 90 or 90 plus. You look at all the branches. This is now funeral policy insurance data. So Port Elizabeth, Mitchell Plain, Worcester, all these places. Um, premium, you can look at exactly the premium information that's available. What are the people paying? The expected payment method, CPS, debit orders, telecash, uh, all those type of things. You look at, is the plan active, not active? Lapse information. Um, and then you can look at the brands, all the various brands, um, what the distribution looked like, the plan, plan types, and so forth. And then you, you build your model. And, and, and in this case, uh, I've mentioned 94% accuracy on the test data, very good model for lapse propensity. But once you've got a model, you've got something powerful. Because you can actually now look at the variable importance. And you can very specifically see which of these variables are key variables in terms of uh, lapse propensity. And here you can see plan cover, plan use term. Um, and you can look at your, in this case, we actually use random forests. So you can look at the decision trees and so forth um, for, for the particular model. And then what's really powerful here, once you've got a model, you can now interrogate the model. And you can do all sorts of interesting analysis where you can now do things like the average probability to lapse by plan, brand, plan category. So now you get a ranking. Now this is now really focused on lapse, why, why people are lapsing. And you can see exactly on the right hand side, right hand corner here, you see the plan brand. You can see the brands that's really, uh, where, where people are really lapsing. Um, and you can see the ones that's not really a, a factor. But you also see the plan category. Um, and you can do the same across age, gender, plan active, plan cover. So here we don't have the, the, um, the gender available for everyone, so it's, in, it's a non-category. But if you look at the males and females that's available here, and you look at the age distribution, you can see the people that's really lapsing here is more than males and between 13 and 37. So this type of information is available. There's a probability associated with that. Uh, males lapse more than females in this instance. Um, but you can look at plan cover as well. But then you can look at the plan branch. You can see the branches where lapses are happening, like Beaufort Vest, Kruenstock, Port Elizabeth, those specific ones. And you can also look at your premiums, plan premiums, where you can say, all right, 350 and 500 um, rand a month, there's where the problem potentially is. So now you, now you can maybe do something about this. So this is an example of where you can uncover insights from the models and provide very useful information. And you can actually now take these models, embed this into AI solutions, we operationalize things as well. So this is a really good practical example of, of, of this type of thing. You can look at payment methods as well. But anyway, so that's all I wanted to show. There's a bunch of other use cases. We're going to have a very nice, I'm looking forward to Yandre's presentation now. Um, on, uh, he's going to take you through um, the vision applications. So without further ado, Yandre, please come in. workshop in the program um, instead of the plan was the initial plan was to take to show you all of the possible all of the tools available for doing computer vision with deep learning and there are actually quite a few and we thought we later on thought it's going to be quite um, it, it might confuse you confuse you if we, if we show you everything and show you how to do a single task 
in all of those languages using multiple other tools also um, necessary for, for getting the job done. So instead of doing that, we decided we want to narrow it down to a single set of tools um, so that we can actually get our hands dirty and, and code up a, a project from scratch for, for, a, for a computer vision application. Um, and today I'm also going to do something a little bit different than what we did yesterday. I'm, I, I prepared a few notebooks um, to, to solve a, a few computer vision problems. But I found that I think I lost a few guys during the middle of the session because I was just going through the notebook, the already written notebooks and scrolling down and, 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 and interpreting the, or translating the code to them. So what I think what might be a better way of doing it today is actually coding the whole thing from scratch, from starting the from setting up the environment where we're going to run everything to the de deployment. I haven't done, I haven't looked at this data set before. I haven't written any code on it before, but I'm going to see if, if we can build this thing in, in, the, in the duration of this workshop and see if we can actually get it to work by the end of the workshop. So please bear with me if I make a few mistakes or some all of the things because all of the things aren't going to work perfectly from the start. But hopefully, my full process and maybe with some of you guys, <coughs> we can we can learn from each other, and you might get a good idea. So I hope you would also get a good idea of what tools they are available and how to use them, and so that you can also learn what is possible with all of the technologies that is available to us now. Um, so just to get a feel for, for you guys, um, who of you code on a write code on a regular basis? Okay, quite a few. Um, and who of you code in Python? Okay, a lot. And has anyone, anyone of you uh, trained a neural network before? Convolutional neural network? Can raise your hands? Okay. Some of you. That's good. So I'm actually going to, yeah, so I'll, I'll try to do this on a beginner level. And just to manage some expectations also, there's gonna, there aren't going to be any formula on the screen. There's not going to be any proofs or any theory. It's, it's just going to be a practical session, only code and, and Jupyter notebooks. And yeah, the reason for that is I think there are lots of, I think there's a big gap between people knowing the theory and, and knowing how to apply it. So, and there are lots of resources on, on knowing the theory, on learning the theory, and and not so much on how to actually implement the solution. So, so I'll try to, if, if, if there are some, some new machine learning, deep learning concepts that I introduce, I'll, I'll try and give a higher level of a view of, of what it is and what it does. Um, but I'm not going to try and explain or, or prove anything mathematically in this session. Um, so maybe, so to give some context, and, and something that we all can, that I can reference to um, throughout the there's a bit of a lag with the lady between my screen and, and the monitor. Um, I want to show you a scene from a series called Silicon Valley. I don't know if any one of you watch Silicon Valley. So for those of you who don't, it's a it's a bunch of guys in a in a in a tech startup. And in this scene, the the one of one of the guys uh, developed this app where it's called Seafood, where you can take a picture of, an, of some food and it's supposed to tell you what type of food this is. So it's like a shazam for, for food. And in this scene, the guy is very uh, excited to show the rest of his team how, how this app worked. So I want to show you this scene. I'm not sure if 
Just uh, actually, I need to ask this um, before I show it. Are any of you okay? So, there are some swear words in this. I couldn't find an uncensored, like a censored <laughs> version. <laughs> <laughs> there are a few uh, F words and, and some derogatory uh, uh, language being used. So, would you be okay if I show it to you? Yes. If, if you I think you're sensitive to this, you might want to leave the room for it. Do you want to ask us something for a budget?
There is an app on the mind. Look at that part. Just demo it. <laughs> okay. Let's start with a hot dog. My beautiful little Asiatic friend, I'm going to buy you the palapa of your life. You will have 12 posts, grated palm leaves. You'll never feel exposed again. I'm gonna be rich. Fuck you, Gilfoyle. Do pizza. Let's do pizza. Yeah, do pizza. Hey, Zach. Not hot dog? <laughs> that's, that's it? It only does hot dogs? No, and a not hot dog. Look, I gave you the ability to spin gold. Instead, you spun pubic hair with shit in it and gravel and corn. Hold on, hold on. Ginny Yang actually put together a pretty good classifier. You know, I mean, the core tech is valid. It just, it just needs to be trained. So what he did for hot dogs, he needs to repeat just for every food in existence. No, that's a very boring work. It's a scraping the internet for thousands of food pictures. You can, you can hire someone else. We can't, because we just spent a big fat stack of cash on little Dinesh over here. And there are other expenses, legal, marketing, operating fees, those goddamn AWS charges. <laughs> <laughs> And so, we do not have the funds to hire scut workers to do your scraping for you. And thus, you will scrape the internet. You and you alone. I'm sorry, the time to back out was before you signed a term sheet. I'm going to tell Lori that this was a smashing success. Go make it one. Yep. Okay, so, yeah, sorry that didn't work out as planned. Mm -hmm. And we're still waiting for an adapter so I can plug an HDMI in here. Otherwise, this delay is actually going to make it difficult for you to follow. Um, but so the reason I want to show this to you is that they actually make a few good points and, and some relevant points when, when, when starting a computer vision um, problem is, so they're mentioning AWS charges in there mm -hmm. and they're talking about a lot of data that they need. So obviously this secret app is not working as everyone expected, it just, you can just um, it can just do hot dog, not hot dog, and now they want to make it work for more food categories. Um, and I and, and we said now they need to scrape a lot of images from the internet just to get this model to work for those images for, for those food categories. And um, so there is this myth in deep learning. I'll, I'll, I'll call it a myth, but there is some truth in it also. But that you need a lot of data and that you need a lot of computing power to do anything in computer vision with deep learning. And to some extent that's true, but there are also a lot of a few workarounds that we can that we can use to make it more accessible for, for people like you and me. And so yes you need big computers, but you don't have to have you don't have to build one yourself. All you need is access to a graphics card, and that you can get on AWS. But AWS, which is Amazon's cloud service, um, their renting and computing time is quite expensive, like they say in the scene. But there are some alternatives, more um, that are a lot cheaper than AWS. And the one we're going to use today is called Salamander of AI. And it's a fairly new service, and I think the cost of, of, of running something on there is, at, I think, at least a quarter of what you would pay when you do it on AWS. Um, did you get one? No, that was a good thing. I just want to simply change your Wi-Fi connection. It's meant to be one for AV on internet. That's where I'm on now. Oh, yeah. Because <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be difficult. Yeah, yeah. Sure I think no, no, no. Um, mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and, and the thing about the data is that if you want to train a uh, convolutional neural network from scratch, you need. Anyone, sorry to ask you this, but does anyone have a, a Mac adapter for HDMI cable? Okay, is it a USB C? Uh, no, it's uh, uh, yeah, Thunderbolt before we always. Yeah, Thunderbolt. I've only gone with the USB. Okay. Thanks. Um, the thing about the data is, so uh, so if you want to train a convolutional neural network from scratch on the image, guess it on a on a computer vision problem, you you will need a lot of data. But the, the fact is, you actually don't need to train it from scratch. People have already done that hard work for you. So there's this big data set called, um, and most of you have probably heard of it, called ImageNet. And there are, I think, 8 million images or so in there with a thousand class, labeled with a thousand classes. And what people do is they train a convolutional neural network on that data. And the things that model learns on that data are actually the features that it that it's able to extract from that that is actually transferable to other related computer vision tasks. So then all you have to do is, is you get that model that people post online or share the, share the parameters online, download it into your environment and uh, you plug that into your model and you just, and then you fine tune um, those parameters just to fit your data with that. But by doing it that way, you don't need all, you only need a few hundreds of data or images um, to train your model with. Um, so that's exactly what we're going to do today, and I'll, and I'll discuss it in a bit more detail um, soon. But so, so what I want to show you today is actually how to build a secret app like they have in this, in, in this show. And I'm I'm going to do it entirely from scratch. I'm going to, I actually saw yesterday, okay, no, let me just start doing this. So I said I'm going to be going to use, and are there, is there anyone who wants to follow the code by themselves now? Would, it, would you be interested in doing it like that? Okay, so let's see if we can, if, if I can accommodate you and that it doesn't take too much of the other people's time to, to follow me. So if you want to if you want to try and copy what I do, you're more than welcome, and you, you can also stop me if there's any questions you have on what I'm doing. So I'm first going to go to the salamander.ai dashboard, and obviously to get started, you need to, to create an account, and I, I already have an account, and. And so just for, the, for those who are not doing this themselves now, I'll put everything online um, and I'll share the link. I'll get your emails from the organizers and, and, and share it with you so you can then just run it when on your own time. So I'm going to log in. Okay, so this is the main page where I can create a server now. And this, in, with this server, I can choose, okay, so here's the name and the location. And they have a, <coughs> the, sorry. You can actually, they have like this witty name generator that you can use to, to <laughs> name the server. So I'm gonna <laughs> go with that one. I'm gonna choose by the amount of storage that I need. And here I can tick so also compared to other cloud service providers, this one is a lot easier to set up. And that's that's a huge bonus. And I also need to add that I spoke to I spoke to the guy who created this and he I asked for some free credits so that you guys can try it out. And so he didn't give me exact he didn't give me coupons just for us, but he said for then for yesterday and today we'll make it to sign up for yesterday or today. Um, you'll get three dollars of compute time just to, to try it out. So that's very generous of you. Um, so yeah, I just choose the libraries that we are gonna that they can that you can get pre installed on the server. And so what we're using today is a library called Fast AI. Has anyone of you heard of the Fast AI courses or Jeremy Malware? 
None of you have. Okay. So poste I is a firstly it's a it's a, a set of of courses online on it's called deep learning for coders. And I can I would highly recommend I can highly recommend anyone to who wants to get started with deep learning to have a look at those courses. There are so there are fourteen courses of uh, around two hours each. And it's an amazing set of course material and there's a huge community um, active community they have this forums page where everyone talks about it and, and help each other and, and share their project and alongside this, this course they built uh, and everything is free and they built this uh, library, this deep learning library called also called Fast AI and it's built on top of PyTorch and so with this library, you have the flexibility of using the of of doing deep learning. Uh, well, they they wrote a lot of wrapper functions, helper functions, so that you don't have to do all the coding yourself, which makes it very easy to to code up a prob uh, a deep learning model. But also, it allows you to go a bit deeper into the code and and be very like scratch around in the lower level code if you really need to make to customize those parts of the um, of the model. And if they're actively working on it, so every time there's a new paper coming out, someone in the community would would implement it and 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 and, put in and um, sorry, add it on to the fast AI library. So when there's some so it's like state of the art things you can you can play with using this library. The other option is obviously, you know, you have a question? Yeah, I'm uh, wondering, how does that compare to something like Keras? Is it even more? Um, Kera, it, it's very similar to Keras. Okay. Yeah. So, so Keras is built on top of TensorFlow, right? And, and I think with Keras alone, you don't have that flexibility of actually, you only have that higher level. The last time I worked with Keras, you only had this higher level um, functions that you can use and you can't actually um, code up the like the lower level operations. You only you can add a layer and you can train the model but you can't actually go like define a specific uh, custom layer for example or a custom loss function. That you need TensorFlow for. Um, but I think they're they're improving on that and I think in the at the I think the, the language, the library you choose to use is between TensorFlow and PyTorch is actually doesn't really matter that much. I just prefer this fast AI library because of the community around it and the open, uh, it's backed by an open source non-profit organization and I just like to support them and um, yeah. So, but if you, if you like TensorFlow, by all means do using TensorFlow and Keras. Um, so we will won't need TensorFlow today, and so I'm just going to uncheck that box. And here you can choose the hardware you want for your for your server. And I'm going to go with this accelerated computing version two. Uh, you can see it's a dollar an hour, dollar twenty cents an hour. Um, but but for most cases, and for just experimenting this one, this K80 GPU would be enough. I just want to to run the, um, want the things to run a bit quicker um, in this session so we don't waste time waiting to change. So this is a 16 gigabyte graphics card and it's very nice to work with. So I just need one of them and I'm going to launch the server. So it's going to take a few minutes just to to get everything started. I would like one of those, please. Have a go. There's still a bit of a delay. Thank you. 
Um, so, yeah, so the data, so, so depending on the use case, there might be data sets already for what you want to do. So that means you don't have to go and collect images yourself and label them yourself. There are tools available for that, but ideally you would want to avoid that process because it's quite time consuming. Um, especially if you, it's a task, it's like a segmentation task or a detection task where you actually have to go and draw polygons around the things you want to detect or you want to draw bounding boxes around the things you want to um, detect. So the first step in, in any in any computer vision application is to see if there is not data online available already. And the best place to go and look for, or I can't say it's the best place, but I think it's a very new tool from Google called Dataset Search. And I just we discovered it with a week ago only, and I would use it a lot. But I'm going to it now. And so if you want to build the seafood app, I want to look for for food pictures or a data set with <coughs> with lots of food, with food pictures in it and I want to know what what type of food each of the images are. <coughs> so I'm gonna search on this on this website for food pictures. And so here here is a list of data sets that correspond to my search. And the first one, first item is this Food Images Food 101 posted on the Kaggle website. And when I read the description, it looks exactly what we need for our use case. There's 101 food categories and there's 1,000 images for each of those categories. And yeah, so like I, I had I haven't done anything on this data set before. I actually saw it today for the first, or yesterday for the first time when I demonstrated this search tool at the workshop. And when I looked at it again, I, I, I realized it's actually exactly what we need for, for doing this. So I'm gonna download it. But, so I, I'm gonna go to the Kaggle website. Kaggle is slow today. So to get this data on our server, we'll need to use the, the terminal. So in, the, in Jupyter Lab, we have this option of opening a terminal running on this server. And so we can't click on the link and then it will download this server. We actually need to, to write a, a command in the terminal to get it. So we we'll use the wget command, and then we'll need the link to that data. But on Kaggle, you need, um, you actually need a profile if you want to download the data set. But there's this useful tool called Curl WGET on Chrome. So you can search for Curl WGET. And there's this extension that you can use that will give you the file path to to something that you want to download. So I already added this to Chrome, and then say so I want to download this data set now. I can click on this download link, and the download is gonna start, but this is already gonna download to my personal computer now, and I don't, I want it on my server. So I'm gonna cancel this, but what this add-on then does is I can, this tool that we get add-on, I can click on it, and it gives me the path to that that data set that I just tried to download. So then I can copy this part and I can run this in my terminal over here. <coughs> and then it will actually download that data set to my server. And maybe the internet connection there is a lot faster than it is here. Every project that I that I do 
do. I like to. So I always have a. I always have a directory called um, works. No, I'm not. Okay. Let's make. Let's just make a directory called workshop. And inside the workshop. So I'm going to go inside the workshop directory now. And I'm going to make a directory called data. Let's go back to where I downloaded the data. Let's see if I just oh. So there's the data I just downloaded, and you see it's a zip folder, a zip file. So I want to I want to unzip it. And I think, yeah, so I first need to install the zip program, which is, they give you the command here, and I'll install it. Strip it back on, because now I've zip installed, and I can unzip this data zip as well. thing I'm just going to do alongside this is I'm going to open another terminal on the server and just the fast AI and library that's on here that's already pre-installed is a bit there you see, yeah, there you see over there um, it's a bit outdated so I'm just going to go into into this library and it's actually a github repo so all I can do is just get pull the latest code from, from that library the notebook that runs in this fast AI environment and 
immediately I'm going to rename it to let's call it C C three and. So the main thing we'll, the main, main libraries we'll need, so we, uh, sorry, I first need to just copy, sorry, just get the I'm going to copy this post AI library to our workspace. And 
there you see that our image is folded. Um, what you can also do is make an iterator using this part. So we can go path, image it. this, but it's just a for loop with a cat being 